Hey, it's Joel. You know what's really exciting? New stuff. And one of the new things right now is Fusion 360's ability to slice files for 3D printing. Yes, within Fusion 360, you can slice a model you've designed and then export the G-code for your 3D printer. We're gonna dive into a first look right here on 3D Printing Nerd. Ah, welcome back. Look at, look at this. I found this headset in a box in my garage, and I hope it sounds okay because, because apparently audio stuff is really hard when I don't have Sean's help recording. Uh, also, my chair, that chair, it broke. It broke. I can't lift it up anymore. So this is the height that you get. If you have any recommendations for headsets or chairs, <laughs> headsets or chairs, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear because uh, I need both of those, apparently. But, you know... You know, let's get away from that right now because we've got something more important. And if I click this button, we've got Fusion, Fusion 360. Here it is. We can now slice for printing in Fusion 360. Here is the brackets that I designed for my filament shelves. That looks pretty familiar, right? Well, from here, in fact, in fact, here, go get Fusion 360 loaded and go load up a model and then you can hopefully follow along. We can now use Fusion 360 to print this because we can export the g-code and we can slice it from fusion 360 i haven't really dived deep here but i i have a general understanding and so i at least want to show you that so over here it's going to probably say design for you but uh choose manufacture because we're going to manufacture this and then you're going to go to setup new setup the default is going to be milling typically change that to now additive and it's got, this is the body selected here. Arrangement is automatic, which is kind of nice because it puts it on that area there. Uh, let's see, machine, we can select the machine. And now in this dialog, click right here. That's going to change the filter. So it only shows additive machines. And then I think we should look for the Prusa Mark III. There we go. I'm gonna select that. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, so it's not on the build area yet, but it looks like arrangement will be automatic when we hit okay. I'm going to hit edit over here, and that's going to tell us about the machine. Uh, max extruders 1, platform positioning, platform scaling, uh, dimensions. Just make sure they're correct. Limits, okay, bed temp max. We can change that because bed temp should be 100. Extruder configuration, maximum temperature should be 300. Uh, let's see, maximum extruder speed. Let's just do 60. 30 seems a bit small there. Uh, fan enabled Z stuff. Okay, okay, this is this is good. So print settings automatically come up. Uh, it's got PLA 1.75. You can see that when you have this print settings library, there is a, a bunch of them to choose from in the samples library. So then, again, it's the uh, PLA 1.75. It's configured for 0 0.2 millimeter layers. I'm gonna hit select. I'm gonna hit edit over here. Okay, this looks kind of familiar. This is the print settings editor, and within this is when I can do all my print settings. Um, okay, 15% infill, layer height 0 0.2, an extrusion width of 0 0.4, that all looks good. Sparse infill pattern, we have a bunch of them. Uh, I'm gonna choose that one right there, and you'll see why in just a moment. Priming enabled, uh, okay, yes. Enabled raft not, good. Support enabled, we won't need it. And randomized perimeter start point. Sure, let's do that. Under extruders, oh, okay, it does list two, but if we remember before, it just had max extruders as one. So it should just pay attention to this one. So this one, 60 on the bed. Uh, let's go 215 on the nozzle. Uh, extruder retract length, that's fine. Uh, change, change start. Okay, all of this seems to be good. Uh, under layer, two perimeters. Layer one extrusion width, uh, multiplier is one, that's fine. Inner parameters first. Layer one height, 0 0.3. Okay, number of top and bottom shells. This all looks standard for a slicing configuration. That's great. Layer one speed multiplier. Okay, so it's gonna cut the layer one speed in half. Infill, okay, those are infill settings. Skirt and brim, uh, let's see, distance is zero. So this is configured as a brim. A skirt is away from the model a bit. I like that better. So number of loops, I'm gonna change that to two. And the distance, let's say five 
five millimeters. So what that's going to do is create two loops as a skirt five millimeters away from the circumference of the model. We don't have wrapped enabled, so we're not going to use it. We don't have support enabled. Uh, bridging, not going to worry about. Cooling, number of number layers fan disabled. So it looks like it's disabled for the first layer, and then uh, it'll kick on, and the minimum time per layer is 10 seconds. G-code, verbose. Sounds good to me. I'm going to hit OK. This is all set up now, so I'm going to hit OK here. Ah, there we go. So it automatically placed it on the print bed. Once it's here, one of the interesting things you can do is reorient the model. Uh, so let's see, if I go up to position and then automatic orientation, orientation target's going to be this. Perfect. OK. Uh, and I'm going to hit OK. And then it should give me some options as to ways that it can be or oriented. And so here's the initial one. There's one. There's two. Oh, boy, there's a whole bunch of choices here. This is fantastic. Uh, I'm going to go back to initial just because that was the best one. That is not a required step, it looks like. That is something that you can just do. You do see there's a red exclamation point. We've got no toolpath. Uh, and so what we need to do is uh, generate a toolpath. There we go. Again, a toolpath is going to be the path that the extruder takes to create the model on the build plate. So by generating a toolpath, essentially, we're telling Fusion 360 to slice the model. Looks like it's done. I'm going to hit the right mouse button and go simulate. And there it is. Look at that. OK, and I'm going to hit play. There we go. And it is building up the layers of the model. And there's that infill. Look at that. So the reason I chose this infill is because on Twitter I saw Tom Sandlatterer talking about slicing in Fusion 360 at the same time I was playing with it. So I said, I'm going to use that infill. And I believe I called it Bowtie Infill or TIE Fighter Infill. That's pretty cool. That looks great. OK, I'm going to hit pause. So we've simulated it. That's great. Now what we need to do is post-process. So in Fusion 360, when you generate the toolpath, it exists. You can then simulate it to show it on screen, or you can post-process it for consumption of, via some other machine, such as you know a 3D printer. So I'm going to go. I'm going to hit right mouse button here and do post-process. I don't have a processor, so post uh, post configuration. It's looking for a processor to use. Search for posts in our Autodesk HSM post library. I'm going to click here. Oh, it looks like I already had it up from before. So these are the post processors for Fusion 360 and any type, any time, any vendor. Let's go to additive. And we've got generic, we've got Prusa, and we have Ultimaker and Big Rep. We're just going to need the Prusa one. So uh, download this to your computer in a place that you can find it. So once you've downloaded it, it's going to look for it in this folder right here. And uh, it's downloaded now. So what you need to do is just close this and then reopen it and it'll show up. There we go. Just like that. We see we have a new process, a post configuration of the Prusa FFF machine, Prusa. Uh, it searched in this folder and it found it. So let's open the config. Ah, look at that. This is the language that determines how the G code is output. And so it's it it sends the processor through this and this determines the G code that's written out. That's really cool. So it's it's language based and it, it's something that you can then augment and add to or Autodesk can add to or Prusa could add to. So in this uh, output folder, which it's going to do some G code and we're going to output it to the desktop. I'm going to hit post and I'm going to name it test bracket dot G code. So in just like that, it's out there. It's saved to that folder. And the way to view it is, well, I'm going to use this, which is unfortunate, but it's what we do. I'm going to bring that G code and I'm going to drop it in to simplify 3D. OK, so it looks like, oh, this is interesting. So here's the bracket. And if I do that, I can see that it is OK, printing it out. I can see that really awesome type of infill. OK, these moves, uh, I wonder if those will show up. So it looks like those are moves uh, that actually extrude filament, which is unfortunate. But uh, why don't, uh, I don't know, this is a test, right? Why don't we, there we go. OK, let's go get this loaded on the Prusa machine and let's print it out. The bed is heated up. The nozzle is almost there. Once it heats up, we'll 
see what goes on. Okay. It is just spitting out filament. Uh-oh. I would imagine this is the, the nozzle priming. It's pretty. But let's see. Okay. Let's see how far it goes. And then let's see if it actually homes before it prints. That'll be interesting. Now it's doing print moves. And there's filament coming out. Okay, I'm gonna stop this and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna take a look and see what settings we need to change. Okay, unfortunately that didn't work, but we have some information and so we can troubleshoot. It looked like the machine didn't home first and it also didn't do any sort of mesh bed leveling. I know that Prusa Slicer does that and it exports G-code as well. So let's take a look at this. So here's the G-code that was made using v uh, Fusion 360. And okay, this is the startup sequence here. So it's setting the bed and waiting the bed to get to 60. And then it's setting and waiting for the nozzle to get to 215. It's doing some setup. Uh, it's got a G0. Okay, and it's going to go to 10 millimeters off of Z. And then it's going to start. So that's the problem. Here is what the Prusa slicer does. Uh, it's a little bit more documented, but we see the same sort of setting temperatures and waiting. And then we say G28, which is a home without the mesh leveling, and then a G80, which means mesh level. So all we need to do is add those instructions, G28. In fact, I'll just copy them right here. All we need to do is add G28 and G80 to the same spot over here. Uh, looks like it was right after the temperature, so there we go. So now we've got the same, or at least a very, very similar startup sequence for the Fusion 360 generated G-code as the Prusa Slicer generated G-code. So let's kick that off and let's see what happens. It's just finishing the uh, mesh bed leveling. I've got 7x7 seven seven grid turned on. Okay, we're up to temperature. So I think it should start doing something. It's doing the nozzle prime. Okay. Okay, is it going? There it is, look at that. Perfect. Okay. That's not, that's not coming off. So you seem to be doing all right. We'll let this go and uh, gosh, we'll see what happens. This is fantastic. The G-code's working. It homed the axes. It actually did the mesh bed leveling. And then it went about doing the printing process. And I used my finger to test. The print was hanging onto the bed. This is great. But we were about to run into another issue. One thing to note, the prime position. So when the nozzle's priming, uh, it looks like it's in the way of uh, the skirt. So that prime... Usually, usually a priming thing is going to be outside the printing area, either along here or along here, but it looks like the priming area is right there. Uh, since I do have it doing uh, a skirt, I have it doing a skirt, so it means that I could probably turn off the nozzle prime, I guess. See what happens? It's doing two loops on the skirt. How does that look? That looks pretty good. Dogs agree? That's right. With that out of the way and really not something we had to worry about, now it was time to let the print go. And we were about to see the first layer be finished and how it was going to look. It's just doing the first layer still. It looks like it's almost complete. It just has those pieces right over there. That's not too bad. I would say this is shaping up to be a successful print. If everything holds on, we should have ourselves a bracket. With the first layer complete, I was pretty confident that this G-code was going to create a model that looked really well. But oh, I was, I was mistaken just a little bit. And honestly, the Simplify 3D Preview really matched reality. 30% of the way there, and it looks like there's some travel moves that actually extrude a little bit of filament. I love that infill. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, it kept going. It very much kept going. And it finished. Look at this. Here is the print. You can see right there. Those are the travel moves that extruded the filament. And it matches the Simplify 3D preview of it, which I think is great. It means that the 
G code exactly matches what the slicer was trying to do, but the slicer just wasn't doing the right thing. So that's that's going to take some some effort to fix on the on the side of Fusion 360 because it's just paying attention to that that file that we downloaded. So in post processing, those are the directives that tell Fusion 360 how to create the G code, and it created the G code just like this, which means that the printer did exactly what the G code said to do as evident by this. It just means that that processor needs to be a little bit more tight, a little bit more robust in generating the G code. The infill in this is that Oxara, I don't know, it starts with an A and I can't pronounce it, but I'm gonna call it uh, TIE Fighter Infill because I think it was fantastic. And really this is in Jesse PLA from Dave over at Printed Solid. And this is, the str this is the strongest bracket I've ever seen. Like, look at this. There's there's so little bend in that. It just, oh, I really like that infill. I'm really excited about this. This is fantastic. This is, this is kind of future looking because Fusion 360 is used for all sorts of modeling. And typically what people have to do is then export the model as an STL file that they can then bring into slicing software to slice. But to be able to slice in Fusion 360 means that we can take some other operations into account. It means that machines that do subtractive and additive, kind of like that Diabase machine, the uh, the H series, the one that's got the spinning tool head, or almost like the E3D tool changer, those sort of machines, this is going to be invaluable for the further development of those. And honestly, I'm just excited that, that this turned out. And how appropriate is this that it is orange printed on the Prusa machine? It's also orange in that I'm going to recommend you to make sure you pay attention to Tom Sandladerer because he was playing with this. And I'm more than willing to bet he's going to put out some sort of deep dive into this. And I trust Tom to give you a very detailed look at just how awesome this is. This is just my first look. I highly encourage you to play around with it, and I'm really curious to see your results. Post them to Twitter and tag me. I'd love to see it again. I'm at Joel Telling on the Twitters. But hey, let's go with this. Consider it a success and look forward to a happy slicing future with Infusion 360. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more. Be safe. Wash your hands. I love you all. As always, high five.